So getting in a fight can be scary, especially if you're up against someone bigger than you. I got an email notification late one night that said Riddick Bowe, two-time heavyweight champion of the world, Olympic silver medalist, 300-pounder, wanted me to get knocked out, which is a little scary. But even scarier was he had joined uh, a team that included local legends like David Ortiz and Larry Bird and the top political, corporate, philanthropic players in the city of Boston to try to bring the 2024 Olympics here. And I and a couple other folks were standing in the way. It's completely understandable to want the Olympics in your city. What's not to like about the world taking its vision to your home, to showing off the best that you have, to world-class athletes and peaceful nations coming together? It turns out a decent amount for host cities. There aren't just pictures of empty stadiums from a couple really, really poorly executed games. There's dozens of studies from places like Oxford and world-leading economists that say that usually the Olympics leaves the host city worse off. When the Olympics were first talked about in Boston, a couple people were in my living room. And we read some of those studies, or at least the abstracts. And we started looking at even more troubling, the process. And what we realized was we don't ever really get to decide as a community. And that's intentional. They wanted the process to get going before people had a chance to say no. So we decided to force a conversation and to put out an umbrella that said, if you think no, or if you want to consider no, you can come here for facts and information. So just in our spare time, a couple people, some tweets, snowballing a little bit into people coming to us and wanting to offer their services. Things like this logo, in fact, donated for free. And what we found was the people that we talked to more and more, we felt like we were gaining some traction. Not enough traction, though. It was an uphill battle. So you can see a headline in the Boston Globe, the local paper of record, saying, why is there no political opposition to the Olympic bid? We made our way into some stories. But in this particular article, and in many conversations, we were cast as part of you know, how small we were was part of the reason why this was a, quote, case study in using power. Power to move on past any opposition. And for TED fans uh, and for others, this probably brings to mind a kind of Malcolm Gladwellian concept and something that we heard a lot. David versus Goliath. And there was a lot about our operation that was a fight. You know, we intentionally created conflict in the media so that people would know about us if they had concerns and could come to us, so that we could take up half of stories that the other side had placed. And when you think of a David who's victorious, they're nimble. They use technology or other more efficient means of getting their message out or of competing. And we certainly did some of that. Uh, at the very beginning, we spent $100 on Twitter ads when the other side was spending $100,000 a month on PR consultants and found that if we just followed journalists on Twitter and were just provocative enough, we could start to take up almost as much space in the news and on television. Uh, but when you think about David versus Goliath, the other big thing about it is it's one-on-one. -on -one. And there's two standing armies on either side just watching. And that's not a good template for social change. That's not a good template for a political battle. Political battles have to bring people off the sidelines and into the fight. And if you're going to get politicians to change their mind, you're going to have to get the majority of that crowd that's watching. And in that respect, 
we were more like the little boy in the emperor's new clothes, that old fable, where the little boy points out and says, but he's not wearing anything at all. And slowly, other people in the crowd start to join in. And like that little boy, we were outsiders. We didn't know any better. We didn't know you weren't supposed to point and say, the math doesn't add up, or those facts are wrong, or we should point out something that other people would just say, well, the powerful people are there. The other big thing was not just getting the crowd involved, but having the crowd tap into something that was already there, that the crowd was already feeling. And so, you know, you might want to, uh, you know, dive into the deep and nuanced aspects that might appeal to a TED audience when making a case. But sometimes it's just as simple as, he isn't wearing anything at all. And we hadn't gotten this across well enough by the time the United States Olympic Committee picked Boston to be the American bid. We'd been up and running for 14 months, and every time we talked to somebody, we felt like we were winning, editorial boards, or audiences that had a high knowledge. In fact, while the overall poll numbers showed less than a third of people with us, the majority of people paying close attention to it were already there. So we had to figure out a way to take this message and win. We went to an interesting uh, place, a couple interesting case studies to find that out. We've seen an article here that we had read around the time of our founding titled, The Don Draper of Pot. It might be an unlikely place to find you know, the, the energy and resourcefulness to combat a powerful opponent. But he really cracked a case in pushing forward the legalization of marijuana uh, in one particular state that's spreading around the country, um, and doing it with something we all learned in sixth grade math, the transitive property. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. There's a lot of complex math or, or complex arguments around many social issues, marijuana legalization and the Olympics among them. But by boiling it down into something that, informed by data, informed by polling, was known to be true, you could go from the minority to the majority. And so what he did around legalization was tap into the fact that almost everybody felt like alcohol should be legal. And at the same time, they felt that marijuana was as safe as alcohol. And what he realized was, if you made sure everybody knew B equals C, they would get there. And so after two generations, four decades of stagnant poll numbers, they saw a 20-point jump in just a matter of years. And that was the 20-point jump that we needed. And so in our context, we found our B equals C. Because people were already against using tax dollars for the Olympics, even though only a third of them were against it in general. So we had one out of every three people that if we could just remind them that the Olympics required a taxpayer guarantee and that Olympics had cost overruns 100% of the time since 1960, we could win. Now, there's also the Don Draper element, which we don't necessarily have naturally. Um, but we had to go out there and market it. We had to go out there and sell it. And we'd already created that conflict and become one of the places that people could go to. We now needed to go to the masses. One of the top kind of talking points that came out was you know, being derisively called 10 people on Twitter as the opposition. There was a certain amount of truth to that. The, the social media pressure at the beginning, getting out there in that form, allowed people to come under one banner and say no. But those people online had translated to real life conversations and also this simple focused set of talking points on TV and in the news media that while we only had 3,000 people on Twitter, could get to the 3 million people we needed in the state of Massachusetts. And that focus isn't always as much fun as getting really deep into a study, if you're the type like a TEDx attendee who wants to get deep into a study. 
We didn't say, read my lips, but we really focused in on a message that we thought the full crowd could come in on. And in the days before Boston pulled out as the bid city to the USOC, less than one in 10 people thought it was unlikely that, as claimed by the proponents, those powerful forces that had the trust of people at the beginning, that tax dollars would not be spent. And it wasn't the sexiest way, it wasn't the most fun way to make our case. But at the end of the day, the crowd came to our side and we believe a template, not only for getting in a fight, but for winning the fight, was focusing in on what the crowd could do to get there. Thank you.